go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we ask your blessing on these that are on our prayer list, the vast interest in our prayers. We just ask that you would heal their bodies and just tend to them, minister to them as only you can. Lord, we pray that you'd be with us tonight as we meet and look at a portion of your word, Lord, that you would You'd show us what you'd have us to see and that your word might find a lodging place in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First John chapter number 5. First John and chapter number 5. Continuing with our study of the book of First John. First John and chapter number 5. You there, say amen. amen. All right. Verse number five, we'll read down through verse number twelve. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? You believe that tonight, don't you? Amen. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. But there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, that's capital W, that's talking about Jesus, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. We believe in a triune God, don't we? That's so easy to explain, I'll let Lord explain it for you sometime, but uh, we've got three, three persons, three persons in one God, the Trinity, and then verse 8, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. This is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this, is, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These verses that we've read, we're moving toward a, the golden verse of 1 John chapter number 5, which is verse 13, of course, where it says, These things I have written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That's the, the uh, flagship verse, you might say, of 1 John chapter 5, really of the, one, of the, one of the main verses of the whole letter of 1 John. These verses we've read are moving toward that. And our text is dealing with truth and the confirmation of truth. In these verses, the Apostle John, along with the Holy Spirit of God, along with other believers who are witnesses, they are all trying to tell us that they are witnesses, that they are bearing record uh, of some certain truth. Now, what is the point of truth that, we're, that, that they are trying to convince the reader of? The context of all of this is at the very end of verse number 5 that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what, he's, that, that's what we're trying to confirm. That's what they're witnessing of. And that provides our context for us. And there were many in John's day in John's lifetime when he wrote this that were denying the truth that Jesus was the Son of God. Predominantly was a group called the Gnostics. And, uh, and these had some strange, some strange beliefs. They denied the, the virgin birth of Christ. They denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, they, there was a group of the, of the Gnostics that came up with the doctrine Howbeit, it was a false doctrine, but they came up with the idea that, that Jesus was just a normal, everyday man, and that God, or Christ, as they say, he kind of came up on, on Jesus, kind of came over him at his baptism whenever he was anointed, 
and then left him sometime before uh, he died on the cross. That's what they believed, and that's what John is trying to refute, and he does this throughout all of his writings. The, the main idea is, is that they were denying that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came in the flesh and died in the flesh and rose from the grave. They denied that, and John refutes that in all of his writings. In the Gospel of John, he talks about how that he, uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the book of 2 John, I think verse number 7, somewhere around in there, he talks about the Son of God in the flesh. And uh, this is what he was combating in his day. In our day, in these days, there, there are many in the religious world, I would say most in the realm of Christianity, they accept the truth that Jesus is the Son of God, but in our day they deny that he has the ability, he and him alone has the ability to save. And, uh, and that's what we're dealing with in our day. And Paul warned about that in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He, he said, in these last days, that whole chapter talks about these last days, and he says they will have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And so, we can glean from what John was dealing with in his time. Let's break these verses down. And I'll try not to be too long tonight. Verse number 6, look at it again. It says, this is he, talking about Jesus, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. When you read the commentaries about this verse, there is a, there is a, 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 a whole... A whole bunch of different views as to what it means that he came by the water and the blood. Most of the scholars will tell you that that's talking about Jesus' baptism and his crucifixion. That he came by water and the blood. Now I'm not going to discount, totally discount that interpretation tonight, but I will tell you this, I'm not convinced that's what it's talking about. I'm not convinced at all that it's talking about his baptism. Contextually, we are looking at confirming the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, if John was dealing with a bunch of Gnostics who, who claimed to believe that God just kind of came up on him at his baptism, why would John be writing about Jesus coming by baptism? It doesn't make any sense. It would, to me, in my mind, that would be a point of confusion. I don't think that's what he's talking about. The Lord's baptism in water in and of itself offers no proof of the deity of Christ. It, it, it doesn't. Now there's a, you have to realize when Jesus was baptized, there was a lot of people being baptized by John in the Jordan River. Uh, what about being, being uh, immersed in water is proof that he is the Son of God. I just, I just don't see that. Now, if you want to attach the events that happened right after Jesus got baptized, right after he came straightway out of the water and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove and the voice of heaven, the voice from heaven said, this is my son, you know, you might say, well, that's, that's pretty good proof that he was the Son of God. But just the baptism, just the baptism being dumped in the water, I don't see it as proof, or good proof at least, of the deity of Christ. The shedding of His blood, it's wonderful. On the cross, it's wonderful to us that believe, but it offered no proof as to the deity of Christ. There were two other bodies bleeding and hanging next to Jesus. What made Him any different? What can we use about that to substantiate that He was the or is the Son of God? I think there's something here if we dig a little deeper, I think there's something here, and yet, yet it's so simple in my mind. I believe that when it says that he came by the water and the blood, not the water only, but the water and the blood, I believe that this is talking about his physical makeup. This is talking about his physical 
being, his body, who he was rather than just what he did. He was more than a baptismal candidate. He was more than, uh, than, uh, than a bloody body on a cross. He was the son of the living God. And that's what, uh, he, he was all man and all God. And this is what it's talking about. He came by water. I believe it expresses his humanity. He was born of a woman. And I, and I would say that that goes back to what we preached about and talked about in the past in the Gospel of John in chapter number 3. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he said, except you be born again, he said in that text, he said, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit. I believe that's talking about the natural birth and the spiritual birth. And I think the same thing is true here. He was born of a woman, the water. It, it speaks of his humanity. And then it says he came by the blood, the water and the blood. He had a, he had a, uh, a humanity. He was all man. But he came by the blood, which I believe speaks of his deity. The blood is not passed from the mother. Somebody say amen. Uh, the mother, uh, the, the fetus lives in there and feeds off of the nutrients from the mother's body, but the blood does not pass from the mother to the baby. And in Jesus' case, his blood came from the father. There's some argument about whether or not blood, a, a baby's blood comes from the father and the mother's stuff. Some say it doesn't come from either one, but they all agree it doesn't come from the mother. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus has came from the father. How do we know? His blood was pure. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, We are not redeemed with such corruptible things as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ without blemish and without spot. It was pure blood, sinless blood. And I think that's what it's talking about. Who is this Jesus? He's the one that is born of a virgin. He's the one that was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He was the, he was the virgin-born Son of God. I think that's the point that Peter is trying to make here. What is more convincing to say that Jesus is the Son of God, would it be a baptism and a crucifixion which was common to many in that day, or would it be a virgin birth and a sinless life? And so he came by water and by blood. In verse number 7, it tells us there are three witnesses in heaven that say that Jesus is the Son of God. It tells us that there is the Father. In heaven, God the Father. John 3.16, I, I, I would remind you of that right now. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Father bears witness. It says that there is the Word that bears witness. Jesus Himself. We know Him to be the Word, capital W. John chapter 1, we've already looked at it in the past. And it said, uh, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we followed that trail all the way down until we saw where the Word is directly connected to Jesus Christ Himself. Amen. And then it says that there's the Holy Spirit in heaven that bears witness that Jesus is the Son of God. It is His function that He always points to Christ. And he always, uh, he always draws our attention to Christ. The Father in heaven gives witness that Jesus is the Son of God. He ought to know, wouldn't you think? I mean, he's the one that, that loved sinners and gave grace to sinners and sent his Son to die for our sin. He ought to know. He's the one that sent him. And God the Son was in heaven and he gives witness that Jesus, that He is the Son of God. He ought to know. He ought to know. He came from the Father, He said, and He went back to the Father when He ascended. And, and He ever lives to intercede for us before the Father. Now, he ought to know. And the Holy Spirit 
is in heaven giving witness that Jesus is the Son of God. He ought to know he's the one that overshadowed Mary, the Bible says. These three witnesses are in heaven. Verse number 8 tells us the, there are three witnesses on earth that say that Jesus is the Son of God, the Holy Spirit. He gives witness on earth. Think about this, through the work of inspiration. He inspired the Bible. Men of old wrote, uh, wrote these things as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. We have a Bible that gives witness that Jesus is the Son of God. Where do we get all this stuff? From the Bible. He does the work of, uh, of, of unction. Talking about preaching, singing in the Holy Spirit, witnessing in the Holy Spirit, testifying in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is involved in all of that, and all of that is done with, with, a, with a true heart and a true spirit gives witness that Jesus is the Son of God. He does the work of conviction. John has already told us in his gospel that, uh, that when Jesus left, he said, I'll send the, the, my Father will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and He will reprove the world of, of sin and righteousness and judgment. He does the work of conviction. And he does that here on this earth. Now, the work of conviction of the Holy Ghost, let me just throw this in as a side note. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, that is not the same thing as regeneration. Just because the Holy Spirit convicts your heart doesn't mean you've been regenerated. That's Calvinistic. They say he has to awaken you, that he has to quicken you. That's the old King James word. That he has to make you alive before you can be saved. I'm telling you, you can't be quickened until you're saved. You can't be regenerated until the point of salvation. I mean, that's getting the cart before the horse. Conviction is not the same thing as regeneration. And conviction is not irresistible grace. Just because the Holy Spirit convicts you and convicts your heart, how long did you go under conviction before you got saved? You can resist the Holy Ghost if you choose to. No such thing as irre irresistible grace. And the Holy Spirit bears witness on earth. The water, it says in verse number 8, bears witness on earth. The virgin bird sets Christ apart from all other men, all other people on this earth. There never was before Christ anyone born of a virgin, and there never has been since, and there never will be. He is one of a kind. I thought of a sermon I heard, the old preacher the other day, I was listening to him, and in the title of his sermon where that was, he said, there ain't nobody like you. And he preached out of Isaiah where he says, uh, 45, I think, where it says over and over again that I am the Lord thy God. There is none else. There is none else. Well, where did Isaiah get that kind of idea? What, what would he possibly be tying that to in Isaiah 45? What about Isaiah 7, 14, where it said, Unto you is born of a virgin. There shall be a virgin that will be with child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Jesus is set apart. The, the virgin birth, you understand how important the virgin birth is to what we believe? Yeah. And then it says that in the earth, the blood is another witness. The sinless, the sinless, perfect righteousness of Christ. It's been a long time ago since he walked this earth. But we can account for a life, in him, we can account for a life lived that was totally without fault or failure. We have the history book that we can go back to. And we can look at the accounts of those that gave witness. And all that the disciples could say about him was, is what manner of man is it? He's different than anybody we've ever known. All that Mary, his mother, could say at that wedding at Cana was, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you. All that Pilate could say about Jesus was, that I find no fault in him. All that Nathaniel could say about Jesus was, Thou art the Son of God. All that the woman at the well could say is, Is this not the Christ? 
We have the witness of the Holy Spirit and the blood and the, and the water in the earth. Verse number 9, we see a good witness and a better witness. It says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. We have the witness of men, and the witness of men concerning Jesus Christ is a wonderful thing, listen to me now, when they tell it to you right. When they tell it to you right. I thought about it whenever I got saved. I told my mom and daddy I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to be saved. I knew I was a sinner. needed to be saved. And they told me how to be saved. I'm going to tell you something. If mom had been a Jehovah's Witness, uh, then I'd be peddling the watchtower right now because I'm just going to do whatever she told me I needed to do. If mom had been a Mormon, I'd be wearing a white shirt peddling a bicycle ring. Because that's that I would have done whatever she told me to do. I'm glad she told me right. I'm glad that they told me right. Sometimes what people claim to know is false. But we have a better witness. It says if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. You'll notice in verse number 7 it gives... Uh, it, it gives those that bear record in heaven. And in verse number 8, it gives three that bear witness in earth. And it's interesting to me that there is one in those two lists that are common to both worlds. And that is the Holy Spirit of God. He's bearing witness in heaven. And He's bearing witness in the earth at the same time. Thank God for the Holy Ghost that brought me under conviction. And you too if you're saved. And, uh, and His witness is greater. Verse number 10 the, tells us that the believer has this witness in himself. In himself. Verse 11, that, look, look at it again. It says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. The Holy Spirit for the believer becomes an inner witness of our salvation. It goes right along with what it says in Romans chapter uh, number 8 and verse 16 where it says that His witness bears with, uh, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. He's in us. Verse number 10, the unbeliever has rejected the record or the witness of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse number 10. It says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. The unbeliever has rejected the witness of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that that is the only unforgivable sin that's listed in the Bible? The sin, the unforgivable sin. What is it? It's the blasphemy of, of the Holy Ghost. What in the world is that? That's whenever the Holy Ghost convicts you of your sin, shows you that you're lost, and you say, I don't want it. I don't believe none of that, and I, I, and I don't want it. That's rejection of the Holy Spirit. You made God a liar. To say that you're not a sinner. John's already addressed that in this chapter, in this book. Verse number 12 brings all of this to, I believe, a very clear conclusion. Simply put, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, I mean, there may have been some other stuff up in there that's confusing, but that's not confusing. That's just about as clear as it gets. If you have trusted Christ, you have eternal life. By the way, I would, I would have you to note that that is the way that this is put to us. That is a present possession. He that hath the Son hath eternal life. That right there refutes all of the work salvation crowd that refutes what the Church of Christ claim to believe, what the Methodists claim to believe, even what the hyper-Calvinists claim to believe, and that is they say, well, we'll have to wait and see how it turns out. We'll have to wait and see if we endure to the end in the faith. We'll have to wait and see 
if, uh, if we've been good enough to get into heaven, I'm glad I'm saved right now. Amen. I'm glad I'm saved right now. I can't, I can't go to hell. It's not possible. That's, right. That's a present possession. If you haven't trusted Christ, the Bible says you're dead in trespasses and sin. He that hath not the Son hath not life. You don't have life. You're living in darkness. You may be walking around, but without Christ, in the words of John Wayne, you're dead as a beaver hat. <laughs> dead in trespasses and sin. Listen now. If you die like that, if you die in your sin, you will not enter into life. You will enter into eternal death, what the Bible calls the second death. The second death, an eternal existence in hell. That's just as simple as it gets. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. All of this, as I said a while ago, is leading up to verse number 13. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know you are saved. Amen. You can know you are saved. How do you know, preacher? Have you trusted Christ to save you from your sins? That's as clear as, as, as I can make it. By the way, that's as clear as John puts it right here. Amen. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be in your house tonight, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we've got more than enough evidence in heaven and in earth to know and to believe and to put our trust in the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and in Him is our only hope of salvation. Lord, we thank you for your, your uh, church. We thank you for this place and what you've done here this past year. What you, We thank you in advance for what you're going to do in the year to come. And Lord, just bring us safely again into your house when, uh, when the time comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.